are now locked into Radio Juxtapose, the home of contemporary art and culture conversation. Coming up today. The art world is too small a place for art, you know? Art is big and the art world is tiny. And in the US, the art world is also totally beholden to the worst rich people ever. If you want to get straight into that interview, then skip forward to about minute eight. But first, let's catch up with your host, Evan Preco and myself, Doug Gillen. This is Radio Juxtapose. You know what's cool about this is that this is this is now how I know it would feel like if I woke up next to you every day. Because <laughs> I just rolled out of bed. And we have our intro. Hey, you know, um, I really enjoyed your Instagram series yesterday. I thought that was really that was really fun. Um, I had to think about it a little bit, but I was it was nice to see other people's responses because I think that's a question that you maybe occasionally. Oh, uh, like the question was what was the what was the specific question? What was the first piece of art that made you fall in love with art? No, what was the first piece of art that you fell in love with? Yeah, it was something like that, um, and. You know, it's always nice to, you kind of ask that question occasionally, I guess, like maybe in an interview, I, you know, I sometimes think about that, I, but it was nice to kind of th- see other people's responses. I don't know, Nighthawks for me, Hopper. That was straight in there. I had uh, Dali Persistence of Memory. That was the first piece I remember seeing, just thinking, wow. That's the really little one, right? In real life. Yeah, I mean, I didn't actually see see it. Yeah, no, I mean, I didn't. I, saw, I, I didn't see I saw Hopper the either. But, in a coffee yeah. table book, so it was about the same size as everything else. It's amazing how <laughs> they all become roughly the same size in a book. Wait, I have a, I, I have a question. Like for, for people on on your side of the pond, when they go to university, do they like? Is it like America where you, like you buy a bunch of posters and put it on your wall because you're living away from home for the first time? Is it the same kind of culture and vibe? Definitely. Okay. Definitely, and everyone ends up with the same ones. The most popular ones were the, you know, the one with the two girls on the bed, and that was it. Was just called yes. Kiss. Yes. And everyone went. I'm into photography, don't you wow. know? And it was like, dude, this is, this is really whack. My 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 roommate and I, who are also friends and from like age twelve on. We uh we we had a pretty classy Coltrane, Dylan, Radiohead, and I think maybe a Dolly poster. I think that was our vibe. Okay, you were you were you were a little bit more highbrow than I. Well, think we were going for the highbrow ladies, opinion. if you will. Wow, <laughs> I was a lit student. Okay, so does that mean the same thing that it means now? What like you were lit? Oh no, no Liter- literature, American literature. Oh, uh, I was I was uh. I was just, you know, happy to be there. <laughs> happy to be part of the process. Oh man, this Thanks is Thanks for having me, guys. This is this has been fun. Oh, I get I get some paper? Amazing. Thanks. What do I do with this? Oh, nothing. This is worthless. Okay, cool. But for all of you people listening that are in university, college and uh, finish because finishing is just a good thing. It's good to finish everything. I'm a big fan if you start something, you should try and finish it. I think that's a good task in life. Okay, so we're going to see this podcast. We're going to see this podcast through to the end, my friend. <laughs> you can half-ass anything you want. You know, it's not like. Do you do you think your opinion of, like when you when you when you wrote yesterday that Dolly that that painting was the one that kind of got you in love with art? Do you like look back on that and go like, oh, that's childish, or do you still like hold that pretty like? Oh, I'm happy. Dear? I'm happy with yeah. that. Like it could have gone worse. I'm gonna do this as a regular series, I think, because like the like I learned so much yesterday. Yeah, I learned more yesterday than I have in you know looking at as, uh, just for a social media flurry. Right, it was like just seeing the a uh, total uh, array of influences and and styles that people fell in love with that went from you know Rembrandt to Iron Maiden covers. So I think I'm just gonna keep that kind of up as a series if I can. And, um, and that, I like that you brought up the Iron Maiden thing because. You know, everybody has different entry points into art. And like, I just was exposed. I was exposed to like psychedelic posters and stuff through my parents, but I didn't really realize there was artists behind that. You know, it was like that kind of weird of course, moment. Of course. So that's why, like, why Juxtapose was so important, you know, in, in a way is that it kind of gave a backstory to those kind of artists. But it's, it's also interesting just how everybody's entry points are different. Some people's like Rembrandt. You're like, well, yeah, that kind of, all right. Yeah. Like, 
okay but yeah. but that's that that's no more or less of a valid answer than an iron maiden album cover. absolutely and it, it's that kind of it's seeing that and then it just kind of all ties in together and you're like yeah you know this is this is the way that art should be kind of looked at and talked about and celebrated and, and I, 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 I i'm excited I for the younger <laughs> the younger generation now who get so many more options to get into art i feel like i think they're it's kind of exciting that everybody kind of has one of the things that's going to come up today in this interview with our guest molly crabapple was her entry point into the art world and how it was kind of a part of her life and it's kind of completely different to how a lot of the guests we've had on have had their attitudes you know they've kind of gone through the i guess the institutional structures somewhat you know they've kind of they've aimed for galleries and you know towards museums and that kind of that that trajectory whereas molly was you know she goes on to talk about how it was just viewed as a trade within her within her upbringing her mom was like look you can learn to draw and you can make some money you can draw for people and when she goes in to talk about the sheer variety of jobs that she's had through art it's like it's really interesting from burlesque uh from painting burlesque dancers to doing you know life drawing to doing uh crowd uh, not crowd courtroom drawing to going on to do illustrations for a a novel that she co-wrote with a syrian defect just kind of think well that couldn't be further away from going well i'm gonna get a i want to have a retrospective in the tate yeah it's like um when you start putting the spotlight on people who do like sign painting or um i I guess just any i don't want to say it's not blue collar but just any sort of like art that gets a paycheck and there's an assignment and there's like this uh listen it's an element of blue collar working class nature right yeah yeah yeah. it's got it's got backstory in there art art as a trade as like a it's like as a craft or as a as a job is so different than that you're right that i'm in my studio i'm making paintings for a show like there's such a and the way it's talked about in society is such a different thing too and i think that's like where i always get a little uncomfortable um with the sort of highbrow explanations of what a studio painter is compared to somebody who's doing something uh that actually will go out into the world and be like utilitarian a little bit so i'm i'm glad that molly's on the on the pod talking about that we'd been trying to get this locked in for for weeks months months trying to get her on and i was really happy that we finally managed to tee up and and undo it uh, this time, I think it's uh, it's definitely one of the uh, one one of the most different do- conversations that you're going to hear on Radio Juxtapose, and uh, yeah, I hope I hope you guys all take something away from that. And it was recorded while I was midway over the United States, so I apologize to the Legion of Diehard Evan fans. This is going to be a uh, you can sit this one out if you have to. It's just me <laughs> and Molly on this one. Trust you me, can it's take, gonna get more listens you can just re- now. Relive the JR one if you have to. <laughs> oh, there's gonna be more listens now. I'm sorry, everybody. Hi, Molly. Um, how are you? Where are you? I'm in New York right now, and hey, I'm happy to be here. So you're a tricky one to kind of to I- introduce because I don't really know where where to really start. Like, what comes first? Are you a are you a journalist? Are you an artist? What's your what's your preferred title of choice? I guess I usually use artist and writer because I draw a lot of stuff, but I write a lot of stuff too. You seem to be kind of active. We try, this is like the nineteenth time we've tried to set this up. So you've just come back from Puerto Rico. Have you been doing other things since then? And that's a distant memory. <laughs> I just came back from L.A. Uh, there where you I, go. <laughs> I was interviewing like the two coolest old dudes in the world for my book. I, these amazing like 87 year old dudes uh, who had been like best friends since they were seven years old. So that was that was really, really cool. But yeah, I, I work too much and I, I travel too much, honestly. <laughs> this is always a this is always a conflict. Do you find that conflicts with the, the kind of the climate uh, change stance in any way? Yeah. Yes, it does. I should be killed for my crimes. I, me and my friend, uh, my friend Murtaza Hussein, we we were just talking about that, and I don't know what to do about it because you know they will eventually. I, I hope if the world doesn't end, they'll make cars you know that are green. But I don't think that there's a way to make planes that are green. And yet, yet here I am murdering the earth constantly every month. My main focus is is my kind of background is in the in the street art game uh, over anything and the street art 
world is is super interesting because it's just it seems in the last like 10 years it's entirely its entire foundation is built on these artists traveling around and painting murals and things like that but there's this huge overarching contradiction of traveling thousands of miles across the world on a plane to then use spray paint onto a wall and emit these gases and it's like and you've kind of you've gone in and said you know save the rainforest it's kind of like where where does that where does that sit so i guess the question then would be does the intent justify the action so i tend to think that the problems with climate change are too big for um individual consumer action to actually do anything on. We Greta seems to be doing quite well at the moment. She seems to be uh, kind of leading the pack on this, even though over here, I, I, you know, you know the girl I'm talking about? Of, of course I do. Yeah, Extinction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that there there's a few individual consumer choices, which I have not made, um, that that everyone should make, which is probably to, you know, eat locally, to avoid eating meat unless it's like, you know, ultra local, you know, pasture grazed, you know, a cow is from the farm upstate from you and to stop flying so much and probably also to stop buying so many goods that are made internationally. But part of the problem is that every single bit of capitalism forces you to destroy the earth. I mean, to, to give you an example, right, I ha I'm an author. I um, you know, write books and you guys do a magazine and juxtapose, I, I imagine, cannot exist if people don't buy more copies of it. Right. Yeah. And I, mean, uh, so, I certainly can't so you know, exist as a writer unless people buy more copies of my book. And yet the exact thing that we need to do is that people need to be buying less things. More things are the problem. Yeah, that that's that's definitely super awkward for a couple of for a magazine and an author to be to be talking about. Let's hope this podcast picks up. Yeah, it's not it's not it's not our it's not our individual fault, right? It's that our that the entire society is built on um the selling and distribution of things. It's not if I stopped writing books and if you guys you know stopped doing juxtapose that um the world would be saved. It's that there's a fundamental structural contradiction between consumer capitalism and not burning alive. So how do you push back on that? Is it up to us uh, as consumers or are we supposed to, where's the most effective position or place to drive change in something like that? If we take an iPhone, which is dependent on minerals being you know, mined from people under the worst imaginable conditions in the Democratic Republic of Congo, we're all buying into this one way or another. So what can we do as in our most effective way to force some kind of change to topple that system? And this has gone way, I was going to just ask, where you were from but we're in here now so we're, <laughs> we're 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 going for it uh yeah what would you say is the most effective position that we can take to um to to force some kind of change on that oh my god so i am not uh i'm not a professional activist i'm not a professional organizer i mean i think that greta probably has many smarter things to to say about how we can you know, gum up the levers of power and keep everyone from you know, burning alive. But the thing that I think that we can do, um, me as an artist and um, you as a publisher of an arts magazine, is that one of the problems is that people cannot imagine a world that's different than this. They cannot imagine a world without capitalism. They cannot imagine a world that's not based on this almost like this model of growth that resembles like yeast or cancer, a model of growth, a growth that grows like a tumor. They can't imagine anything else. And I think that in addition to not eating meat and flying less and taking part in Extinction Rebellion and all of those things that we should just be doing as people, what we can do as artists is we can uh, help imagine uh, different futures. A lot of talk about climate change, and, and we've been doing this now, it involves personal sacrifice. Like, I don't want to not fly. I don't want to give up burgers. These are awesome. But there's also ways that um, the world can become more green that are actually better and more pleasurable. Uh, a while ago, I um, was really lucky. I got to collaborate with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez on a video for the Green New Deal and with uh, Naomi Klein and her husband, Avi Lewis. I, I was the animator for it. Yeah, so I saw, I saw, I saw the, the video you're talking about. It was really well done. Thank you. And the idea was that we didn't just want to do this like dystopian vision where we're all, you know, eating bugs and living in refugee camps. We wanted to show like what 
a good green thing would look like. I can't speak about England, but I'm just going to speak about America because it's where I'm from. Sure. Like American cities, most modern American cities are um, built for cars. Uh, people live really uh, far from where they work. There aren't stores where they live. Um, very often there aren't even sidewalks, right? So you have to drive everywhere. And this, you know, is obviously it's terrible for the world, but it's also terrible for people because it means that it's really hard to see your friends. It means that there's no like, you know, nice European communal style life, right? With like plazas and markets. It means that you're really, really isolated and it also means that probably all local cultural particularity has been uh, destroyed by big box stores like Walmart. And it makes you live in this like really ugly, lonely place and live this lifestyle that simultaneously is destroying the world and destroying your soul. This is I, I, I saw you sort of bringing this in on Twitter and I'd never really thought about that kind of structure in, in, in America. And it feels maybe maybe it's it's i think it's definitely accentuated in american lifestyle cuz you know you you go to la you go to miami uh, and it's just you need a car you can't do anything without a car you can't rely on a, a public transport to be able to get you from a to b your sto- your nearest store is a, a you know 10 minute drive never mind a walk and it just feels such a, a a kind of almost a complete part of the American structure. Do you do you think there would ever be a point at which it would change from uh, you know out with the inner urban environments of places like New York or Chicago? Do you think you could see that dependency on cars actually changing? Uh, there are two points on this. The first thing is that America did not have to be this way. It wasn't like mm. it wasn't like America was fuck public transport. We're all cowboys. No. L.A. had streetcars and they were bought by car companies and ripped up. So this was a very uh, deliberate uh, thing that was pushed by car companies to make more money. And so it's not natural and it can be undone. The second thing is that a lot of places, especially um, you know places in the Midwest, uh, Rust Belt towns, they have all the bones of having dense, beautiful downtown life. Like, you know, if you go to a place like, like Buffalo, right? They have a a beautiful old um, downtown that was built. And so many places have beautiful old downtowns. Uh, They were just abandoned and disinvested in. And people can live in those downtowns again. There's no reason. There's no reason not to. And they're filled with architectural treasures. I don't think that like everyone has to live in in terrible suburbs. I think that there are just economic incentives uh, that, that are forcing that. And the other thing that I was riffing on a bit on my my Twitters was uh, I've been spending a lot of time in Puerto Rico since the Hurricane Maria. Mm. And um, Puerto Rico, you know, is a Spanish colony before it was an American colony. And so it has all of these like really beautiful old Spanish houses, you know, with the balconies and the internal courtyards. And they're just very well built for uh, the environment that Puerto Rico is. And because they were built in an era before air conditioning, they're actually cool inside, right, when there's no power. And after the hurricane, I spent time in those houses and I spent time in the uh, American style suburban houses and the American style suburban houses without electricity are hell. They're literally like being locked in some sort of prison torture box that they used to um, torture prisoners that ran away by making them too hot. They're, they're just, they're horrors. And the Spanish houses, while, you know, not ideal are, are livable. And it made me think a lot about how a traditional architectural styles are what we need to go back to in a lot of ways if we want to deal with climate change, because you can actually... They're, self, they're self-sustaining. Yeah, and they're not to an totally extent. dependent on, on energy. Yeah. Do you see then, I mean, because you spent quite a bit of time in Europe uh, in your earlier years. Did you see anywhere that you you felt was kind of just largely kind of getting lifestyle, living, connection to to the wider picture. Did you see anywhere or it, ever since then, have you seen anywhere that's kind of, you feel it's getting it right? I saw some farms that were squatted in southern Spain. This was in 2010. I, I don't know um, what happened to them. But at the time, there were like these huge landowners. Like One of them was the Duchess of Alba, people who had so much land and they weren't, it was just lying fallow. And then you had all these like unemployed young people. And I saw this really amazing farm of people that had just like taken over this land and were using it to 
could grow some organic produce. And it was, it was great. I also, I've always um, sort of had my heart uh, with the, the you know, squatters in Greece. Uh, right now, there are huge raids um, in Exarchia. They've arrested over 100 immigrants and they've shut down four squats. It's, it's really, really nasty. But I always felt that those squats were an example of how people could kind of live together in a post-borders future. And that didn't mean they were ideal. It didn't mean that they were a utopia. But when I would go into a place like City Plaza, which had just been, before it was a squad, it was a bankrupt hotel that had um, closed owing huge amounts of money to its workers. Uh, the workers allowed activists in, and then it became a home for, I want to say, 700 people at one time. Mm. And I look at taking disused property and turning it into a functioning place for like really, really pretty desperate families to live in. And I think, my God, that's certainly a better model than you know these hell camps where people are freezing to death and burning themselves alive from despair, which is like the other model in Greece. How would that then apply outside into... You describe a, a sort of a, a, a post-border society or, or, or world. How, how does that look? Oh, God. So, I mean, I think that there's two ways the world is going to go. Either borders are going to fall or um, there's going to be a hardcore fascism. And the reason uh, that I, I say suppose, that... As opposed to that mild fascism... <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, much more. I mean, like machine gunning people at the borders, fascism and much worse internment camps. How about this much more fascism on a much larger, bloodier and more obvious scale than than we we have it now is what I mean. Yeah. And the reason is because there are at, um, you know, the current levels of climate change and God knows we're only accelerating them. Uh, there are parts of the world that are becoming unlivable and people in those parts of the world aren't just going to die. They're not just going to cross their arms and say, oh, well, they're going to move and try to save their lives. Um, they're first going to move to neighboring states. Mm -hmm. And um, then eventually they're going to you know, keep moving to um, richer countries. And they're not going to stop. It's not something that you can you know, just be mean enough to them and they won't come. It's not like that. They literally cannot live in the countries that they were born in. And so uh, countries will have a choice. It's either to um, allow them in mm -hmm. and you know, try to integrate people or to um, shoot them. And a number of countries are already um, routinely murdering people at the border. Uh, Turkey right now is um, routinely murdering uh, Syrian refugees at the border. Uh, other countries like my own are you know, running concentration camps for people that are fleeing. But... As um, more and more people leave their homes, this will obviously, you know, this 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 tension, this pressure will only grow bigger. And I think that if the world doesn't figure out how to give people human rights that aren't based on what passport they hold, I mean, the results are going to be horrific. Um, the other reason that um, I say borders don't make sense is look at the Amazon right now with Bolsonaro. He is destroying the world's largest carbon sink so that uh, ranchers that he's allied with can make some quick money. Hmm. This doesn't just affect Brazil, right? This affects the entire earth. How can the idea of national sovereignty make sense when what one person does in their own country within their own borders can destroy the entire world? So where does that leave institutions like the the European Union or the UN, if we are borderless, you've got the, obviously you've got the sovereign state, but then what are we just globally policed? I'm just trying to picture, I, I like the idea, I like the, I like the notion of, of being completely free to be able to move around the world. I mean, we have it in Europe and it seems to, uh, for the last, for a certain period, it, it worked really well and something happened and then they decided that that had to be scrapped. So I'm just trying to picture in my head how that would, that would look. I mean, I don't know. I'm not a policy person. Yeah, yeah. I, I just know that the alternative to it is going to be massive concentration camps and shooting people at borders and all of the concurrent propaganda that goes with that to get societies to dehumanize people enough to accept that. Do you think there's an element then for people that are living in safety that have only grown up knowing 
you know, comfort to 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 whatever degree that might be, you know, national stability. Do you think it's it's do you think that, think it's harder for them or borderline impossible for them to ever see what happens in you know places like Syria or 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 in South America, areas of South America, Central America? Do you think it's impossible for them to to really understand and comprehend how quickly things stability can be taken away? I think that's why it's really important for everyone to speak with older people. I mean, maybe many people in this generation of British people, right, have, um, you know, experienced a lot of comfort, but their grandparents certainly didn't. And their grandparents had a very uh, good and sharp view of how um, things can fall apart. Mm. And, you know, I think many Americans, too, especially, you know, those of us who are either, you know, from immigrant backgrounds or, you know, indigenous or black backgrounds also can see how quickly um, things can just change on a dime. I mean, I really think that one of um, the best things that anyone can do or two of the best things is first read history and then, you know, have like really good relationships with smart older people because you'll, you'll learn a lot. And I think even if you can never feel what that trauma is like in your bones, at least you'll feel that it's related to you if you talk to your grandma and she tells you about what it was like for her. How much did your background inform your current social political stance? Well, my dad's a leftist. Uh, he's, he's a Marxist, a uh, political economist from Puerto Rico. And when I grew up, my dad would like to kind of, you teach me about these basic concepts of Marxism in a way that's kind of adorable. And also, I guess, a little bit unexpected for how you might talk with a seven-year-old. Uh, for instance, <laughs> I, I remember he would like take a cup. And he'd say, why does this cup uh, cost this price? Like, what, where does the value come from? And I'd say, oh, you know, the cup, it's glass and the sand. And I would, I would try to break it down to materials. And he's like, no, no, it's that. But also it's the labor, right, to take that sand and make it into glass and to blow the glass and to shape it and to dye it and to distribute it. And what is labor? Labor is human life. So in this glass, there's human life. But that that human life could never be adequately compensated because if it was, uh, the capitalist couldn't make a profit. You know, that's you know, surplus value. And so I'm like seven. That that was how I how I grew up. So it was quite a big part of your upbringing then, I think it's very Oh, say. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And my mother is an amazing artist and she's an illustrator. She's worked her whole life as an illustrator. And so um, I think a lot of kids, they have this idea that you can't make a living doing art, that it's something very far away. And for me, I was like, art is a perfectly normal way for adults to make a lower middle class living. You know, it is it is a trade. You can draw things for gumball machine inserts. You can uh, draw stuff for toys. It is totally normal to uh, to do art and to pay the bills. And it's not a lavish way of life, but it's a normal one. I, that's that's an interesting an interesting turn of phrase because it's not often that we. In fact, I think you'd be the first guest that I, I've spoken to on here that's referred to art as a trade. Oh, art is absolutely a trade, and I think that historically it was always viewed as a trade up until like what the late nineteenth century. So for me, there's there's two elements of it. There's the uh, the craft element, right? The part where I know how all my paints work. I know how to make certain lines with brushes. I know all like the bones in someone's legs. So when I draw the legs, they look good. And then there is uh, the inspiration part, which is this weird sort of, I don't know how to describe it, but like, you know, God visiting you. And I'm not religious, but that's the only way to, to describe it. And I can control the craft part. I can work really, really hard. I can get better. I can't control the inspiration part. That's something that's mystical. That, you know, is something that's just visited upon you. All I can do is try to make sure my craft is good enough that when inspiration visits me, I express it to the very, very best of my abilities. Would you say then that you're drawn to conflict for the to help inform your craft? I think I've always been drawn to the parts of life that I don't know how to describe this. I feel like you're such a good interviewer, by the way. These are amazing questions. This is this is an astoundingly. It's making me think so much, which I love. Um, it's all it's all going to unravel now. You do realize <laughs> that you've said that. Yeah, you jinxed yeah, yeah. it. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's, it's all it's all going to fall done. apart horrifically. I mean, I think that I'm more drawn to the edge spaces of life, and that doesn't necessarily mean conflict. I got my start drawing in burlesque clubs. 
And I got my start, you know, chronicling acrobat girls, the war rhinestone pasties. And then I started covering uh, protest and conflict and refugees and, you know, climate disaster in Puerto Rico. I think I'm just interested in the sort of sharp, pointy bits of the world, I suppose, the place where the fabric of the normal kind of phrase, and that can be in a bunch of different sorts of contexts. How do you then stay as, because in in a lot of these situations where you're dealing with something that's kind of uh, maybe geopolitical or there's loads of different elements of this discussion that are coming in and, and bits of truth on each side, how do you make sure that you are, especially when you're vocal, not necessarily only exclusively within your art, which is sort of reiterating stories and things that you've seen, but you know, when you're doing this direct channel on Twitter and things like that, how do you make sure that you are sitting there as informed as you possibly can be? I mean, I think it's always a struggle and that anyone who's a, you know, a journalist or a writer uh, who says that they've gotten it right every single time is a liar. First of all, I, I tried to read as much of the historical context as I can. I think sometimes it can be really to one's detriment when they think that a conflict started yesterday and when they don't realize all of the chains of interests and all of the different factors that led to things exploding now. I also um, I try really hard to learn the language of places that I write about. Um, I studied Arabic for seven years. My spoken Arabic is pretty moronic but I can read and write it fluently. And I think that being able to do that has majorly influenced the sort of people that I'm able to speak to, uh, the sort of sources I'm able to have, and the sort of reading that I'm able to do. So I was just going to go in then a little bit. How Can you maybe, just for those that aren't aware, that, uh, that haven't had a chance to read Brothers of the Gun, can you maybe just sort of uh, give us a little bit of context and background as to how you sort of became involved in, 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 in this particular region and, uh, and further on into Syria and the Middle East? Well, I, I first went to the Middle East when I was 17. I, I was not in any sort of um, you know, journalistic capacity. I was just, I'd graduated school early and I was backpacking around Europe. And actually, I shouldn't say the Middle East. That's a misnomer. I first went to North Africa when I was 17. I just, I wanted to go to Morocco. And so I, you know, went to Morocco alone. At that time, it was very, very uh, cheap to be there for an American. And I um, sort of fell in love with the architecture and with the language. Ever since then, I, I went to Turkey for three months when I was 18. I went to the Syrian border. I went to the Iranian border. It was like right after, it was right after the truce was signed. Uh, so this was still part of, this wasn't part of a journalistic political quest. It was just just intrigue over anything else. Yeah, I think, and especially artistic intrigue. And like there was this, um, it was this ruined palace uh, in Dobeyazit, which is a mountain right next to Armenia and Iran in Turkey uh, called Ishak Pasha Sarai. And I still remember that. I saw it in an art book and I was like, I got to go there, man. And I, I traveled all around Turkey by by bus, you know, when I was 18 and just with this idea that I would see it and it was so beautiful. And then I went there and they did the world's worst restoration job on it and it looked like a Walmart had, you know, gone over it. I was very sad. But yeah, so that was when I first, I guess, started being being interested. And then I didn't go back for a really long time because I was, I was working. And then uh, Occupy Wall Street happened and there was a lot of, a lot of visits by uh, activists from the Middle East and North Africa, especially from Egypt and Tunisia. And at the same time, um, as, you know, Occupy collapsed and as uh, the revolution in Egypt you know, was sort of overtaken by this horrific military coup, there were a lot of people who were my friends who were reporters that were covering the Arab Spring and especially were going into Syria. And I heard so many different narratives of what was going on. And so in 2013, I was able to talk uh, the New York Times into allowing me to document um, the situation of Syrian refugees in Tripoli, which is a city in northern Lebanon. And I went. I mean, at that time, I was like, I was super green. I had just started doing, I guess I had started my first journalistic piece was like a year and a half before. And I, I didn't really know that much. And I just was going into these these refugee camps and hearing really unfiltered 
stories that people had of, of the regime and of bombings of uh, their. Did you find those stories quite unified? I mean, unified in a way, like the story that was unified was about uh, regime bombing. No one who was in a refugee camp in Lebanon, um, you know, has has any um, doubt about the regime, the regime bombing. I also started at that point to hear the first stories that I'd heard about ISIS, mm-hmm. mostly in the sense of ISIS uh, stealing people's things. I also um, heard stories uh, when I was interviewing uh, gay men who had fled Syria about endemic abuses by all sides, uh, both by rebels, but also uh, by uh, thugs allied with the regime who would um, blackmail them and you know, arrest them and beat them up and extort them. That was my first time covering anything with Syria. And the thing that the, sto- the sort of story I always tell about, like why I um, kept going back to cover stuff was uh, there was this older woman, she was like a working class lady, uh, who was living in an abandoned building with her family, including her um, husband who had lost his legs because he couldn't, he was diabetic and he couldn't get insulin. And um, this lady, she was like a really nice lady, you know, kind of like like a tough woman, a tough, hardworking woman with a big laugh. And uh, I hung out with her for quite a bit. And she was, it was right after the uh, Obama uh, red line thing. And she says, you know, we're, we're being murdered with, uh, you know, with bombs and my son was arrested. I don't know what happened to him. And, you know, isn't America going to do anything? And at the time I was uh, very opposed to America uh, doing anything because I was aware of Iraq. Yeah, exactly. I, I spent a lot of time protesting Iraq at that time. I... This is where it gets super confusing for, for the exactly. situation. Exactly. Exactly. And so I I told her, I was like, look at what America did in Iraq. America just fucks everything they touch. I think I said it in a slightly nicer way, but that was the gist. And she was like, well, we're not Iraq. And I didn't have anything to say to her. And I still don't. I'm I'm not some, you know, military, military genius or anything. But it stuck with me. And I I, um, kept going back to uh, to write about refugees. And uh, I visited Syria once only for a day, too. Um, I, I didn't stay longer because I'm not brave like a lot of other war journalists are. I was I was cowardly, and that's why I only went one day. One of um, the uh, friendships that I made while I was covering Syria was I uh, on Twitter. I got to know a young man in Raqqa, which was then the capital of uh, ISIS's quote unquote cosplay caliphate, and he was a young uh, English literature graduate uh, named Marwan Hisham. We got to be friends on Twitter largely because I was uh, studying Arabic and he had this amazing like classical Arabic education. So he's always sending me poetry and stuff. Is that the best way to, to learn, I guess, the, the old classical stuff? Or if I was learning English and someone sent me Shakespeare, <laughs> I feel like that, that would be the well, worst I mean, way for me to learn English. It wouldn't help you get around, you know, the bar, but yeah. Shakespeare is also it's his own reward. The structures of the language, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean... So this this is something I've always I've also felt with Arabic. Arabic has dysglossia, which means that spoken Arabic that people, you know, use in their day to day life is actually a different language from uh, the formal Arabic, which is the Arabic of you know political speeches, um, Al Jazeera, newspapers, literature, and so generally people you know depending on their interests they either study the formal stuff or they study one of the many dialects, and each of those actually leaves you at a really bad disadvantage. If you're like me, you just sound like a, a nerd and a dork. You, you you know, when I go to the Middle East, I'm practically saying the and thou to people, but okay. mispronounced. <laughs> where, where is Wednesday bathroom, good sir? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but the alternative is, if you only speak dialect, is you can't read a book. And imagine if someone was writing about England and they had never read any books or any newspapers by any British writers whatsoever. Like, imagine what a poor understanding of the culture they would have. Like, if they couldn't read Orwell and they couldn't read Shakespeare and um, they couldn't understand, you know, speeches at Parliament. So it completely disconnects you from one faction of society. Exactly. One thing disconnects you from daily life. The other one disconnects you from intellectual life. I've never, yeah, I've never heard it sp- spoken like that or, or sort of broken down like that. That's really interesting. Yeah, like imagine if someone like just didn't know that English people wrote any books. 
or, or newspapers. They couldn't read them. They didn't know what they were. They didn't know they were important. Um, but they knew exactly how to, like, you know, go to Croydon and talk to people. I mean, they would have one image of England, but it wouldn't be the only one. And it would be a very narrow one. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you add in like the weird power dynamics that the West has to the Middle East, it like actually starts getting really fucked up really soon. If you are completely divorced from any sort of appreciation of the intellectual life of of the Arab world. That's that's a whole other side of things. So what was your when you then started to continue down that path? Did you have something in mind that you were set out to achieve? Was it you wanting to to help bridge the gap between your experiences within the Arab world and a Western audience? Or what was the intent behind your your journey? I don't think there's anything that grand. I mean, I would feel like an asshole if I said that. I I mean, I think that, you know, there's plenty of Arab writers that do a much better job than me. I think with Marwan, when me and him became friends, I, I had this idea that since, you know, cameras and journalism were completely their band in Raqqa was under ISIS. I asked him, I said, like, do you have any photos on your phone? You know, just normal photos. Like we all have photos on our phones of life. I was even thinking maybe, you know, from before the war. And because I, I told him, I was like, I'd love to draw from them if you do. It might be interesting. And instead he's like, I don't have any photos, but I'll take some. And then because Marwan uh, is the bravest journalist I've ever met in my life and also quite mad <laughs> sometimes, he went helps. around... <laughs> Yeah, quite mad. He went around surreptitiously taking photos inside ISIS hospitals and of bread lines of like ISIS dudes, like checking out chicks, all of this stuff that he had specifically chose to be against ISIS propaganda. And um, he got away with it. <laughs> and thank God. And he gave these to me. I'm looking at them and I'm like, I'm not supposed to see this. You know, I'm seeing through through your eyes a place that everything in the world is supposed to prevent this interchange from happening. And and so I drew them and I I asked him uh, to write uh, captions for them because it's his hometown, you know, and this article, it went, it went really viral. Mm -hmm. And we also decided that we really liked working together. And so we did two more pieces like this, uh, one from ISIS occupied Mosul and one from uh, Eastern Aleppo, which was uh, under rebels at that time, but not under ISIS. And after that, um, you know, we're, we're quite good online friends. And I asked him, I'm like, do you want to do a book? He decided yes. And I told him if he wanted to do a book, he couldn't, you know, stay in Syria and do it. He had to, you know, go someplace where he had a laptop sure. and, you know, some, some stability. And so um, Maroon went to Turkey in 2015 and we spent uh, years uh, doing a book that were there, his memories of um, the revolution, uh, the war, and ISIS. They're also the story of his two best friends, one of whom was this like really cool, kind of like bad boy, you know, like cool, cool guy um, that uh, also was an art student. And because he was arrested and he had witnessed torture, he joined a rebel group and he was killed quite early in the war. Uh, the other one of his friends was this guy's uh, brother who uh, left his literature degree in Lebanon to go back to Syria and join uh, an Islamist group called Ahrar al-Sham to try to avenge his brother's death. And uh, me and Marwan, we wrote this together. I did I did 82 illustrations. The, it was the same number as the amount of illustrations in Goya's Disasters of War. And each of these illustrations... For most of them, I didn't have any photo reference because they were, you know, of moments that you wouldn't have photos of, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Like moments when a bunch of wounded ISIS fighters are checking their... You can't jump on Shutterstock and find these, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just not there. So the way I would would do these would be that Marwan would art direct the hell out of me. He would very often do sketches for me. He'd pose, you know, in the same positions as he remembered these guys. I would do like a million sketches. He'd tell me I was wrong. He'd tell me I fucked up. And we'd go back and forth and back and forth until um, I made images that he thought were true and that lined up with his memory. That's a really old school process. Because you used to do, uh, it was, or maybe, no, sorry, perhaps you still do. I, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, courtroom drawings. Is there sort of like that speed element in there that's quite similar? It's actually quite a bit different. So I still do courtroom drawings. I, I, I just... 
I just was drawing the Golden Dawn trial in Greece. In courtrooms, everyone's moving in front of you. There's live people right there, and you have to pin them down on your sketch pad. This was the opposite. In this, there's no people. There's nothing to see. There's no um, reference very often, uh, unless, you know, Marwan would sometimes find me reference of, like, the type of soft drink people would use. And so instead, it's um, very slow because it's trying to do sketches, trying to maybe look at a bajillion things that might be sort of like uh, what Marwan had seen. Me doing the sketches and then him being like, fuck no, got it wrong. And then me doing the sketches again. Yeah, I suppose it's kind of like maybe it would be like the yeah, it's like someone trying to, to describe a dream or something like that, trying to illustrate a dream. I'm just trying to think what it would be closer to. That's such a it's such an interesting un- interesting uh, part of the process, and it, it it kind of once again it kind of that jumps back to that idea of kind of the the trade of art, you know, the within the the courtroom stuff. And I mean, what to me, what's really important about it is. There's a lot of places in the world that there are not cameras. There aren't usually cam or not cameras that the public has access to. In prisons, right, uh, at checkpoints, in detention centers, normal people, they can't see what's going on there. And it's very different to read about something than it is to see something. It's very different. Uh, they, they strike you in very different ways. And there's a reason that um, cameras are not allowed in those spaces, and it's usually because uh, powerful people are doing bad things. Mm-hmm. And what art can do is art can reach back in time through people's memories and make those places visible. Uh, If you've ever seen uh, Joe Sacco's Palestine, he does that a lot when he's uh, writing, when he's illustrating the uh, memories of Palestinian people who have been, uh, you know, been detained in Israel's prisons. It's just something entirely, entirely different to see what it's like because once you can see something, then you can even start to kind of feel it in your own skin. Whereas to read about something, it's still in many ways an intellectual process. Yeah, I mean, it's the TV over radio. Exactly. What's your relationship like then? I'm interested in with the art world because the things that you describe, this is not the this is, you know, not necessarily the usual pattern that people follow when they decide to take up a career in art like I said I was you know when we were talking earlier it was you know they want to be part of this they see the art world as the gallery world and exhibitions and things like that but you're talking about something vastly different on a different side of this this spectrum what's your relationship like then with the with with the established art world Uh, for most of my career I didn't have any relationship with the established art world and I don't think that the members of the established art world who were aware of me viewed me as an artist. I think at best they viewed me as an illustrator. That would probably be kind. At this point, I I do have a gallery in New York. Shout out to Postmasters. And it is nice to have a place where, you know, I can do six foot tall paintings and, you know, they're displayed on the walls and they look nice, you know. Um, But I, I just feel like the art world is too small a place for art, you know. I... Art is big and the art world is tiny. And in the U.S., the art world is also totally beholden to the worst rich people ever. You know, the, the people like the people destroying our society and profiting off the blood of immigrants and getting everyone hooked on opioids are the people that are on the boards of so many major art institutions. I used to be, I guess, like a little bit more hostile to the art world at this point. More. Sorry, did you just say more hostile? Yeah, more hostile. <laughs> But I mean, at this point, I think I've mellowed. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think Sounds the art like world it. is cool. I think that exquisite objects are cool. Um, I don't think most contemporary art is good. <laughs> I, I don't think I don't think most contemporary art will hold up as anything. But for the contemporary art that is good, I'm glad that it's being, you know, displayed in a lovely way. But if the entire art world fell apart tomorrow, it wouldn't have any effect on my own career except that I, I wouldn't have this this lovely place to, you know, hang my six foot tall paintings when I feel like doing them. I have you, to think of something else. Do you find yourself in an awkward position then when you when you go to a museum as an informed, you know, as an informed person on the on the sort of societal structures and how things get to places? Do you look at walking around the British Museum or something like that? Do you view it in a in a kind of do you think you 
view it in a sort of different way then to how people can go around and go, hey, look, this is lovely, this is old. For you, is it an institutional kind of rot? I, it's hard, right? Because it's not like this is something new. I mean, it's not like Michelangelo was being financed by good people. Michelangelo was being financed by mass murderers. And art at, like, the really grand, gorgeous art that we love, right? You know, the... Um, the Blue Mosque, um, the Sistine Ceiling, you know, these, these classical works were always financed by the worst people ever. I mean, because that, that's how you accumulate enough money to create, you know, grand golden works of art in the first place. And so there's always this like kind of fraught interplay. And I don't think it's a new thing. I don't think it's, you know, something that, that, um, the, you know, the Guggenheim or whatever invented, I, I think that splendor and depravity have always kind of lived, you know, close to each other. And when I say that, I don't mean that we should go there and we should all like be whipping ourselves and wearing hair shirts and being like, oh, no, it is based on oppression. I mean, that it just might do us some good to realize, you know, the contradictions that exist within the world and, you know, beauty, and rot and all of these things can in many ways coexist and, and feed each other. I, I don't know. I, I, I think, I guess I'm someone who likes to look at paradoxical and complicated things sometimes. Do you think then that the, the amount of information that we have access to and the amount of equal disinformation that we have access to, do you think this is helping or hindering uh, progress? <sighs> Both. Um, I, I think on one hand, there are so many things that would never get attention if it was not for uh, social media. I think about the uh, Ferguson uprising, for instance, and sure. I think about all of, you know, the, the decades, um, cent you know, centuries that um, black people have been murdered by uh, police, by state authority, and how it wasn't listened to. And then I think about what it did when there started to be, like, video proof of that. And it's really messed up that the rest of America needed video proof to believe black people. But on the other hand, it um, increased visibility and made people take this seriously in a way that I think would have been incomprehensible 20 years before. On the other hand, though, the human brain is not meant for this. The human brain has capacity to now to, or pe I'm sorry, people, we have the capacity to see every single fucking miserable thing that's happening in the world, all of them, all at once, all the misery. It's almost like what the Buddha saw, right, when he left his uh, palace as a prince and he sees death and he sees despair and all the horrors. People have that now. But it's not making anyone, you know, achieve some sort of nirvana. It's in many ways making people just either feel incredibly overwhelmed and anxious or else if um, they want to sort of turn away from being overwhelmed and anxious, it's making people kind of glory and cruelty. I think I think you're probably probably pretty right on that. Do you think it's possible for people to change their their perceptions on things? You know, we, we talked earlier about how you were you seem to have been uh, largely informed by the upbringing and everything like that that you had. Is it possible to go the other way? Do you think if if you were on the other side of a spectrum, having maybe lived the same life but without that? the background that you had, do you think it'd be possible for you to change? Do you think people can change their, their political outlook or their just general outlook? Of course they can. Um, people, people change all the time. I mean, people are shaped by their life experiences. You have people, you know, who have a kid and it suddenly changes how uh, they view the future of the world. You have people who lose their home to a fire and it suddenly changes how they view material things. I mean, you have people who lose their parents and it changes how they view the death and permanence. Uh, people are utterly shaped by uh, their life experience. You've talked a lot on, at least I've seen you've written and you've talked a lot about uh, sex workers, rights for sex workers. I think this is a really under-talked about subject matter, in the, at least here in the UK it is. It's not something that's been on the, you know, on the floor for, I, I don't know when the last time it was debated in Parliament. Uh, tell me what, who's doing it right and what are they doing and what should, in your opinion, uh, countries be doing to ensure the protection and, and safety of, of um, sex workers? So, first of all, 
almost all sex workers and almost all you know, pub public health groups are in agreement about what should be done, which is decriminalization. There is not really a lot of debate. That's what, you know, World Health Organization, uh, you know, Amnesty, uh, that's what groups like that advocate. And that's because whenever you have any aspect of sex work criminalized, what you have is you have cops going in and beating up women and raping them and stealing their money and then often putting them in prisons or immigration deportation centers. And I think that whatever anyone thinks about uh, the morality of sex work, whether they think it's good, whether they think it's bad, whether they uh, would not want to do it themselves, I think that we can all agree that putting women in the position where cops get to uh, tie them up and take them away in vans and lock them in cages because of how they, you know, how they use their bodies is a pretty fucked up thing. I hope, I hope everyone can agree on that. In the U.S., there was a law that was called SESTA, SESTA-FOSTA, which made websites uh, liable for um, what was posted on them in regards to uh, sex work. And what this law did was it basically destroyed the places that women who, I'm, I'm sorry, not, not just women, but the people who were sex workers used uh, to advertise online thus forced a lot of people either to work on the streets or to work um, with pimps. This law was devastating for, for, uh, for sex workers in the U.S., especially for trans sex workers. There were quite a number. There was, I'm trying to think of how many, but there were at least several um, trans women um, were uh, assaulted and even uh, murdered because they had to go back to working on the streets where they were really visible. So after SESTA and FOSTA passed, there was this wave of like really united um, sex worker organizing in the U.S. that was so powerful. And it was like cross community. So, you know, you had like black and Latina trans women. You had Asian women who work in massage parlors. You had like the sort of, I guess, stereotypical sex worker activist who's like a fancy girl who went to a nice school. You had all of that working together because this law devastated everyone. And the thing that happened in in New York, at least, which I think was unprecedented, was you started to have uh, politicians really backing up these sex worker groups. You, ha you have two state senators now, uh, Jessica Ramos and Julia Salazar, who uh, both like canvas with sex workers and speak at their rallies and, um, you know, view them as constituents, which to me was pretty unprecedented. Like usually sex workers are seen as um, the objects and not the subjects. They were suddenly given voices. It, or they were listened to, more yeah. to the point. Um, does that make you feel optimistic about where in this particular region, this particular sector, do you feel optimistic about how that will eventually go? And it, it, I assume it's just not going fast enough. I am optimistic about how it is going in New York. Um, there was even a bill that was written. So in New York, we have this really, really messed up law where we have a crime that's called uh, loitering with the intent to prostitute. And what this means is that a cop can go up to you and because of a checklist of stuff, he can decide that even if he didn't like hear you, um, you know, offering to do sex work, that you were probably going to do it. And the checklist includes like wearing a short skirt and carrying condoms. Jesus. And as I'm sure you would imagine, almost everyone who is arrested with this law is a black woman. Like it is, it is just the like harass black women law. And um, or one part of the let's harass black women law. Yeah, it's yeah one one of many, and it is, it's this horrific law. And as I'm, I think many people know our. Um, you know, jails in New York are horrific and very, very abusive. And, you know, people die in them all the time. And um, so there was a bill that sex workers rights groups uh, did to um, end this law, because you shouldn't have a law where women can be arrested for carrying condoms or be arrested for wearing short skirts. You know, it's Victorian. Yeah. Um, this was not put up to a vote, but it has a bunch of sponsors. And just the fact that there are politicians who are willing to go to bat for this, who don't view it as, um, you know, just a, a waste of time, I think is very, very hopeful. I think it's something that in America we couldn't have imagined before. 
is it something you're likely to see come uh, cross party? New York is its own thing because um, in New York City, there are almost no Republicans. <laughs> There's like th three of them. It's it's really a Democratic machine place. Mm -hmm. I don't I mean, I could see some like, are there still libertarian Republicans? I feel like all the Republicans now, I think another type of Republican could have gotten behind it. Probably not the ones that we have now. And I mean, to give you the idea of um, the consequences of these laws. So there um, was a... Uh, a young woman, she was she's black, a black girl and uh, she's trans and she was a performer in uh, what they call like the ballroom scene. That's like where, you know, voguing came out of. Oh, wow. Yeah. She was, you know, like beloved member, you know, beloved performer, member of the community. Yeah. And she was picked up uh, on accusations of prostitution and she didn't have money to pay bail. So um, they put her in solitary confinement, which is something pretty common that they do to trans prisoners in New York. What, what, why is that the go-to? Sorry. They claim they claim that it's protecting them. It's, it's you know, which yeah. it's not. Solitary is torture. But yeah, of course. Anyways, so they put her in solitary for unclear reasons, but probably because um, she was trans, mm -hmm. and uh, they refused her medical treatment, and she died. Wow. And I think that anyone who believes that. Um, you know, laws against prostitution are protecting women. They need to look at the fact that laws against prostitution took a young woman, locked her in a cage where she died. The other part of my question within there was then, have you seen anywhere that is currently, is anyone getting it right? So generally people um, say, use New Zealand as an example of a good model in the sense that um, it's decriminalized and also um, sex workers are able to unionize and organize in that way. Mm -hmm. And but also because it's decriminalized, that means that if, you know, a client is violent, you can call the police on them. Yeah. There's a really, really, really good book uh, called Revolting Prostitutes, which breaks down all the different legal regimes like way better than I could. It has a lot on New Zealand. So everyone should, should read Revolting Prostitutes. Um, I, I just realized I, I, we've, we've done this. I haven't... what. Molly, what's your next book on? The one that you mentioned a wee while back. Because we've covered so many different uh, sectors of, of, of discussion here. And I honestly, you could offer me a million pounds to try to take a swing at what your next book is on. And I, I don't think I, I don't think I could, I don't think I'd have a clue. What, 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 what's the subject? Um, it's about the Jewish labor boom, uh, which was yeah, I wouldn't a... Yeah, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, did, I, did, I did an article on it last... That's a safe million right there. <laughs> so the Jewish labor boom at one point was the most popular Jewish political party in Eastern Europe in 1938. And it was secular, it was socialist, and it was anti-Zionist. And it has been like completely erased from history, both uh, because of the Holocaust um, and the Soviet Union, but also... Um, because of the way that um, Jewish history is kind of biased to viewing things as like the lead up to the creation of Israel. And because the Bund was really, really anti-Zionist. Uh, my great grandfather was a member of it, which I know because he was also an artist and he like painted all these cool scenes of it, you know? Like he has this scene, I swear to God, it has to be him. There's no other way to describe it. It's this couple, there's like a boy and a girl it's at night and the girl, she's dressed like a Gibson girl, big hair, bustle, and she's throwing rocks through windows. And then her boyfriend is there with like a bag of rocks so that she doesn't have to carry her own rocks, but she can still throw them. Oh, that's, that's nice. Yeah, it's sweet. It's like that's, date night, right? Yeah, that's, that's like better than any date I've ever taken anyone on. It's the equivalent of buying, buying the burger. <laughs> exactly. I'll hold your rocks, babe. Quickly, destroy that building. Her own rocks, but she should certainly have the joy of smashing the windows. <laughs> so uh, I, um, I I got really into researching the Bund when I saw all of these cool watercolors that he had from it. And I wrote an article for the New York Review of Books last year that was more popular than I ever could have expected in my life. And after I wrote the article, all of these amazing older people whose parents and grandparents were, were in the Bund back in Poland or in Russia, they got in touch with me. And, you know, I got, got to be friends with them. And they were the, some of the best people I ever, you know, met. And so I realized that since, you know, I had access to these people's memories and also since there was so much more that I hadn't you know, covered in the article and since people found it so resonant that I wanted to write a book 
on it. So that's my that's my next project for for the next two years. So that I was going to say, how's that time time period looking? Oh God, kill me, kill me. So I had to fucking study Yiddish to do this because the Bund they were. See, um, wow. Okay. It's really hard, man. I never studied any. Uh, it, Yiddish is kind of it's like medieval German with Hebrew with some Hebrew words that are written in Hebrew letters. And I never studied any German languages before, so this is killing me. It's really hard, but you know, it's they they did all their archives in Yiddish, and you can't write about them if you can't read their archives. How's that as a language then? To like, yeah, how how do you how do you wrap your head around that? Is was is there any similarities? I guess then between Arabic and any of these other ones, or Yiddish and any of the other ones. Actually, so this is the funny thing with Yiddish and Arabic. So you know, Hebrew and Arabic are very similar. I can imagine. Yeah, sometimes it's even almost the same word. It's just you pronounce a letter a little different. So there are Hebrew words in Yiddish because, you know, it's a Jewish language. And so every so often there'll just be this like sentence of German, incomprehensible German, you know, German, German, German. And then there, then I'm like, oh, my God, I know that word. That word's like Arabic. And it's like this shock of, of recognition. And, you know, I love the Arabic language so much. If, mm. I, if I didn't have anything else to do, I'd probably spend all my time studying it. You know, it's like this, 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 this shock of like, oh, there's this beautiful other thing that I studied coming up in a language that was spoken so far away from the Middle East. Molly, thank you for taking some time to sit down and talk with me. Yeah, I really appreciate it. It was incredibly interesting hearing you navigate through all these different different parts of, of the general makeup of, of life. And, uh, you know, I, I, I look forward to reading your next book.